change where I moved away from the miracles. I had started on the miracles. I was done with the sermon. And then I realized, I said, you know what? They had texted me. We've been talking back about what they were going to share. And this whole idea, they, they, they said it three or four times already. That series of sermons that I did about three, four years ago on submission without understanding changed them. That phrase was in their heart all the way through this process and still is. Submission without understanding. I'm not going to preach that sermon. But as I was preparing for the miracle sermon, just in the introductory verse, something was said. I talked to Jacob, and then I believe this is what God wants me to share with you this morning. It's a verse I've read before and have even preached out of it before in Luke chapter 9, verse 61 and 62. And another, another individual comes up to Jesus and said, Lord, I will follow you, but, but let me first go and tell everybody goodbye who are at my house. Let, just, I'll follow you, but let me go tell everybody goodbye. And Jesus said to him, no one, no one, no, not even one, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. No one. Um, can you put up the map? And I'm hoping that this works still. Let me get this on. So, as I was preparing for the last sermon on the, the last, or not the last, but praying, preparing for the miracle that, um, that I was going to preach today, I realized that I had moved into the last year of Jesus' ministry. Now, there are three of these maps. I'm only showing you one. This is a map of Jesus' journey, the last year of his ministry. And there's a, a map of Jesus' journey, his first year and the second year. And, and if you would go look at them, you would, you would notice some things. But in this map, in his last year, it's even more, to us, it looks chaotic. So let me just kind of walk you through it real quick, if I can figure out which button is the laser. So we go over where is number one. So it's his third year starts in Capernaum. That was his, where he was living and dwelling. Starts in Capernaum. He goes down to Nazareth just for a quick kind of a quick visit. Does some things there. And then he runs up and he's all over Galilee. Then he heads back to Capernaum. Then he crosses the Jordan River over into Bethsaida. Then he crosses over again into, over onto the other side into the Galilee and that area of of Galilee near the Sea of Galilee then he goes back to Capernaum then he goes all, and that's where we were last week he goes all the way up into southern Lebanon trying to find a place of solitude remember so he goes all the way up into southern Lebanon from there he goes up even farther north takes a journal farther north and there's nothing recorded that he does there. It just says that he went there, and we don't know how long he was there, but when he is there, he actually finds solitude. Nobody bothers him. There's no records of miracles or anything like that taking place, but he travels even farther north. He is way out of the land, the promised land. He's way out of Israel. Now, when he comes back, he goes all the way down to Decapolis, and that's the place where he was told never to come back. That's the place where he healed the man with the legion of demons, and they ran him out, and, and he said, okay, I won't come back. But he comes all the way down here, and the miracle that we were supposed to be dealing with takes place there, and there's incredible miracles take place there because there's been a, over a year, and the man that was cast out, had the demons, demons cast out, was told to go tell everybody what God did, and he did, and it's a total different response a year later. So he, he goes there. Help me find the And then he crosses the sea of, uh, sea of Galilee into Galilee again. Then he crosses again back to Bethsaida, trying to find third. Then he goes up to Caesarea Philippi. Then he goes up near Mount Hermon. Then, where's 15? Then he comes back to Capernaum, goes down into Samaria, comes all the way down to Jerusalem, goes over the Bethany, crosses the Jordan River, comes back to Bethany, goes up to Ephraim, looking for 22. Over in Perea, across the Jordan River, down to Jericho, back to Bethany, and ends his life, his ministry in Jerusalem again. You say, what is all of that? 
I had a conversation a few weeks ago with a, a good pastor friend of mine. You see, the passage about a man who puts his hand to the plow and looks bad is unfit for that plow or unfit to follow Jesus. That passage is almost always universally preached to missionaries and preachers. And yet, that's not the context at all. That's, that's not the context at all. But because missionaries hear it over and over again and pastors hear it over and over again, that any time they even begin to, to change a church or change a ministry, they are flooded with guilt. They're flooded with guilt, and they go, I, I don't know, what am, I, I mean, am I taking my hands off the plow? And that's not what this passage is about either. This passage is not about giving you a guilt trip. It's, it's, it's not a, a passage for preachers and teachers. It's for all those who want to follow Jesus. And the idea, and now I'm going to ask you to do me, because I can already tell I'm never going to get to that little clicker. So just go to the next slide. So, so let me share with you what I really think this passage is all about in keeping your hands to the plow. I'm supposed to follow Jesus. I'm supposed to follow Jesus. That means I keep Jesus in front of me. I keep my hands on the plow. The plow is doing his will. That's all it is. Don't make anything more than that. Doing his will is what is required in order for me to follow him. For me... It is preaching and teaching the gospel. But God has a will for you as well. That's your plow. That's your plow to do the will of God. You're, when, and you're holding on to that plow, but you're following him. The plow is always in front of you because Jesus is in front of the plow. And he's not pulling the plow. You're pushing the plow. So if you're going to... Be worthy of your calling of following Jesus, then you got to keep Jesus in front of you. You also got to go to the next slide, and you got to keep Jesus in sight. It's, in other words, you don't just have him in front of you a couple hundred of miles, and you're saying, you know what, one day, Lord God, I'll, I'll get to where you are. You have to keep him in sight. you got to make sure that you're following close enough that you cannot lose sight of him. Because as you saw on the map, Jesus always did the will of God. And yet when you find him plowing the plow of him plowing the plow, he's all over the place. He's not situated in one place. He's all over the place. He even goes to places that you and I, we had to sit and scratch our heads and say, why in the world did he go all the way up to southern Lebanon? Why did he go even farther north? Why does he come back and go back to a city that told him never to come again? Why does he go to Jerusalem over and over again when they keep running him out? Because you see, for Jesus, the will is the will of the Father. He has decided he's going to do it. The Father is in front of him, and he's keeping the Father in sight. For you and I to follow Jesus, we got to keep our hands doing what God has called us to do. And that is simply following him and that changes it can mean that at one moment of your life you spend your time loving a church and as a youth minister working with them pouring your life so much so that 40 years later they're still calling you and texting you and Facebook messaging you about counsel and advice. But it also means that when God will moves from there and takes you to start a church in a gas station and watch that church grow and build five times to the place that is, it, it is constantly growing, you're keeping Jesus in front and you're keeping him in front of you, keeping your eyes on him. And so when he calls you to go to into missions and leave everything and take your two little kids for us to Costa Rica and Belize. It's not hard. You hold on to his will when he brings you back. 
as a director of missions and you fall in love again with another group of people and God says, keep plowing. We're going this way. And you do that for 13 years and God says, keep plowing. You're going this way. And you end up here. You see, that's the way it was for Jesus. I think that's the way it is for most of us. Don't let the enemy shame you. The only reason you should have shame is if you've stopped doing his will. The place of his will changes. You only get to the places of his will as long as you are able to submit without understanding because I guarantee it, every time he calls you to do his will, it's going to always be beyond where you are. And where you are is always comfortable. You keep plowing. Keep Jesus in front of you. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you keep plowing. And somehow you manage to plow with your pot ready. Because part of his will is going to be at times he's going to bring that plow to a standstill and he's going to stop at somebody that's going to need for you to just pour yourself into them. And you're going to take your hands off the plow for just a moment and replace it with a pot filled with all that he has filled into you and you're going to pour yourself out. You're going to go back to plowing. While you're plowing, he'll be filling that pot up. Then he'll stop again. Twenty-five different cities are singled out in the last year of Jesus' life. There's a lot of whole people in the midst of that. I knew when I got ready to preach today that Daryl Haney wouldn't be here. But I really wanted Daryl to hear this. Thumper, I want you to hear this. I want all of you to hear this. Following Jesus simply means doing what he has for you to do at that moment. But as you do what he has for you to do at that moment, he has a tendency to replace the little things and give you bigger things. And if you prove to be faithful in the little, he'll give you much. The plow is not the ministry. The plow is following. It's what I do to break up the fallow ground in my life and in others' life as I move one foot at a time, keeping Jesus in front, my eyes on him, Keep plowing until he brings us to a place where he says, you go to Wesley's house and you take that pot and you pour it out and you anoint him. You love all over him for I have chosen him as a chosen instrument. And you go and you love on him. The same thing is true for each of you that are followers in Christ. Every single one of you, none of you are different than me. Don't look back.
keep your eyes on Jesus and keep plowing. Don't ever become a person that can only talk about what, it, what you used to do. The only way you can do that is because you're no longer plowing. Praise team, come. You stand. What is it that God's been calling you to do? What kind of submission is he's looking for you to do? And you're still expecting him to give. You've got a whole list of questions. And God is saying, you know what? You're not going to move from where you are until you get rid of those, that list of questions. God has a purpose for each of us. If you've stopped plowing, your plow is probably still right where it was where you left it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you need the Lord and, as your Lord and Savior this morning, if you need to do what Wesley has done, I will be delighted. I will be honored. I will be jumping up and down to allow or to have the honor of sharing Jesus with you. Father, you are Lord. May we act like it right now. In Jesus' name, amen.